How's it going, everybody? Thank you for being here. My name is Antonio, and you're about to watch or listen to the fourth episode of the 2023 Outlook series. In this one, I am joined by Joe Mazumdar of Exploration Insights, and we're going to be focusing specifically on his outlook on various commodities from copper to precious metals to battery metals and energy. But what we're not going to be focusing on is... Uh, what you should or shouldn't do. We're not going to be focusing on giving you any financial advice because neither me nor Joe are licensed to give financial advice. And this is just going to be a, a conversation, a conversation that's going to be general and impersonal in nature, and one that will not include, again, any financial nor professional advice of any sort, but it will include a lot of forward-looking statements about high-risk speculations that you shouldn't blindly trust and you should always double or triple check what somebody on the internet says and always do your own research. That all said, Joe, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Thank you very much for the invite. Pleasure is all mine, of course. Um, it's, it's been a while since we last spoke. I believe you just came back from um, Vancouver, right? How, how, how are things there? How's the sentiment? Oh, I, actually, I live in Vancouver. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I was... I was uh, I was at some of the conferences locally, and uh, I must say the attendance has been really good uh, uh, at the uh, roundup, uh, as well as the recent Metals Investor Forum. Uh, uh, Brent Cook, my partners at the uh, Vancouver Resource uh, Investment, uh, blah blah, uh, uh, here in Vancouver. That's a, that's happening right now, uh, and uh, yeah, he was flipping me a few pictures. The, the attendance there is very good as well. Mm, nice. Nice. Yeah. I, for the record, I know you live in Vancouver. That's what I was laughing. I just had this in my head. Like, okay, I'm going to be talking to a few people who went to Vancouver and then go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to ask. So stupid mistake. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's uh, okay. As I was saying, it's, um, it's, it, you know, it's, um, when did we last speak? It's been a while since we last time. It must've been last summer and, uh, pretty much everything else since we last spoke has, has sort of sucked in the markets besides since the beginning of the year. So uh, hopefully yeah. we don't jinx it this time. But how did you how did you end up closing the year? What, what was your performance last year? Well, I mean, I think in the end, we were like uh, the, the closed positions, the ones that I closed uh, were down uh, like about 20 percent, 15, 20 percent. I closed like four or five, like right at the end of the year. You know, when you have some of these exploration plays and you're sort of uh, convinced that they're not going anywhere and you'd like to take your money out and put it in something that you think uh, is going to go somewhere. I did I did a bit of that right at the end of the year and just took the losses. Um, but what I did notice that of the precious metal companies, like end of September, October, they started moving up around the last quarter. Uh, and so like at the beginning of the year, uh, you know, the the portfolio, you know, since the initiation of positions was up about 60, 60 percent, uh, 65 percent. And then at the lowest, it was basically flat uh, uh, by the summer or whatever, uh, you know, and, but, but then by the end of the year, uh, it was back to about 15 to 20 percent. Um, now uh, it's around 30 you know, uh, it's still been a bit mixed in January, but uh, but I, I can see a little bit of a change in sentiment when there are good results out there. Uh, you know, it's not a, always a liquidity, uh, you know, uh, event and people are actually buying on mm -hmm. good news. The concern now might be is because, you know, January and March are usually two of the months that people raise money is that. You know, when you do have a good result, people then think, okay, you're going to raise money. And so there might be some sort of backing off, uh, waiting for that, uh, you know, the other shoe to fall. And so we have seen some uh, private placements in January on the back of resources, on the back of good intersections and stuff like that. But uh, uh, it's nice to see that there is a market and the attendance and the conferences uh, suggest that the, you know, the interest is renewing. Mm -hmm. Well, your performance sounds to have been at least better than mine i did um I, I made quite a few mistakes actually i've since reflected on them i uh, talked about them in, in a video so i'm kind of okay with it i guess you know you learn from those mistakes but 
Uh, I'm just wondering, and I ask this out of everybody who I speak to, do, do you still make mistakes? Like, what well, was there something that, you know, after all these years, something that you would do differently if you could go back you know, 55 or whatever weeks it is now? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that, uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't call a mistake when it's geology, when you drill the hole and it's not there. That's for me, not a mistake. That's, that's the risk we take. That's mm -hmm. why you know, people say, oh, it's triple bagger, five bagger, 10 bagger. But when there, when there is that kind of potential for return, there is that potential risk, which people, you know, it's not asymmetric. It'll go the other way. Uh, so that I don't mind. Uh, the problem is when you have a risk that you thought you'd addressed and was okay and it didn't turn out that way. And, and I can, you know, cite one where I thought this copper development play in, in Alaska was going to work, you know, it, it checked all the boxes, had good partners, uh, locally state and, uh, and, um, and also industry wise, uh, and, um, they had this access road, uh, and then that permit got, uh, rescinded. And now it's sort of like sitting there. Uh, but, but then, you know, that's something I didn't expect at all, you know, and I didn't see that risk, you know, uh, and, and, um, but after that, I, you know, uh, you learn from it in terms of, okay, you know, I, I thought that they had access. They, I thought it was easy, and and then I didn't see somebody else coming in, and so uh, that's some more due diligence I have to do. That even though the company tells me and the state likes it, everybody else likes it, but it it only takes a small group of people sometimes to make something uh, delay something to the point where you know the share price will go down significantly, which 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 it had, mm. you know. And and yeah, that, that that was a mistake. And probably more of the mistake was I probably should have sold right at that point. But then I was sort of like a little bit in shock thinking, you know, that can't be right. You know, this is going to resolve itself quicker. And, you know, I'm not going to take the hit now. But the resolution didn't happen. It's still not happening. And that's one of the companies I, you know, sold, even though it was the right commodity. Hmm. It was just uh, the wrong situation. I think this is not too much talked about out there like everybody talks about the upside potential when you're talking about cyclicals right especially when it's exploration companies um in a potential commodity super cycle whatever everybody talks about that upside 10 20x or whatever they look at a small market cap or even worse they would look at a five ten cent share price and they would say oh this can go to five dollars but yeah. Hey, what about the risks? And like, hey, you have, you know, mining analysts like yourself, you've worked for Newmont before, but like just you have plenty of experience. You're good at geology. I mean, you're a geologist too, I guess. Um, and, and then it, you, you can still make mistakes. So that's oh, yeah. I think like, that's an important point. Can, can, you can maybe talk more about that. Well, the thing is that if you look like when I, when I became an equity analyst, so I was an equity analyst for a brokerage firm, you know, covering junior companies, like, uh, you know, I'd only worked for big companies. And so mm -hmm. for me, a junior company would have been Yamana or I am gold, you know, uh, not some of these, well, what we call juniors or like micro caps. And so when, when you, when I came here, you know, um, then people said, Oh, you know, this, this stuff is very risky, you know, and, uh, these guys, uh, you know, might not know what they're doing. And then I sort of thought, well, you know what, working in Newmont, Phelps Dodge, and one of these other companies, we made mistakes, but we had a portfolio of mistakes that were blended with um, a lot of wins. When you when you blend all that in, it looks okay, you know, because we can, you know, not talk about this asset that much, but talk about that one over there that we were successful at. And it's, you know, it's just like when a junior releases a bunch of drill holes, you know, what do they highlight? They don't highlight the, the worst hole. They highlight the best hole, you know, but there's some other holes in there that you got to figure out, you know, do they, do they kill this thing, you know? And, and with, with, at, at some of these companies, you know, we made some big mistakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the global financial crisis, you know, big companies like, like BHP almost went under, tech almost went under. Uh, during the global financial crisis, you know, one tech because of the investment in this uh, coal company, um, uh, you know, uh, and BHP uh, for their acquisitions. 
So, uh, so anybody can make a mistake at any level, you know, uh, it, it happens, you know, and even if you have a whole bunch of people working for you and you can still make corporate mistakes, you know, mm. and, and some of those could be big enough to take the whole company down. L look at Rio Tinto's, uh, you know, uh, advance of the project in, in Western Australia that they got wrong and they, you know, set off these explosives and those explosives were, um, you know, in an indigenous um, site, you know, and uh, uh, that basically got the entire board fired and they had to bring in a new CEO. Um, uh, they're still having problems at resolution with respect to getting that thing going. Uh, and I'm not saying that's, that's a mistake or anything like that. That's just, you know, how long it takes uh, for some of these projects, you know. So mistakes they happen at any level, uh, at any knowledge level, but um, I guess uh, it, the, the 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 less you know about these companies, how it works, uh, and management teams in that, uh, the probability that you'll make a mistake is probably higher. Mm. It's not like you can't make a mistake, but you know your chances are higher that you will make a mistake. You know, if you talk to somebody that's been in the industry longer and said, oh, that guy, I would never do anything with that guy. Or mm -hmm. that asset was this asset and it was impossible to permit and most everybody got out of it. And that's why it was cheap. Mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. Yeah, in the end, everybody makes mistakes. I guess I've, I've asked other people about this too. And then it always concludes in like, just uh, accept that you're going to make mistakes. And be ready for them. Be ready for them mentally and and financially too. You know, be be just make it so that when you make a mistake, because it is a when question, not an if question. When you make a mistake, you're not financially wiped out. You know, it's not all of your money in one play, and then you lose it, and you're out of the game because you're going to yeah. make mistakes. So, yeah, there's there's one school of thought that says if you really really like one you know project asset company, put all your money on that one. There's another school of thought that said, oh, you know, diversify as much as you can. I mean, that'll get you less risk, less return. The other one will get you more return, but more risk. Mm -hmm. And it's all about what risk you're willing to take on, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and knowing that this is just fun money. And if I lose it, I lose it, you know, sort of like uh, uh, betting. But the more knowledge you bring in, and that's what the letter helps for me, is that I have to. I bring in an investment thesis because I'm not only buying for me, I'm I'm sort of letting people know that I'm buying. I'm not telling them to buy. I'm just telling them what I'm doing. But I feel more of an obligation and a responsibility to make sure, obviously, I check everything. And then I have a thesis. And then every time news comes out, I check that result versus my original thesis. Does this still make sense? If it doesn't make sense, then... I sort of, you know, put out in 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 the letter that, you know, this didn't come out as well. So let's wait and see what this hole does, because if that hole is not good, then, then you know, we're done, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I don't really shock them a week later or two weeks later and say I'm selling. And they go, oh, where would that come from? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I sort of build up to it, mm -hmm. you know, because then I say, well, you know, I give them my impression, my sentiment on it. You know that that wasn't a good news release. I'm still holding because of X, Y, Z, but you know I'm watching this. Mm. And then your wife, who's a geologist, also gets angry at you. I assume. Oh yeah, but but for other reasons, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. how many how many holdings do you do you hold? Because you said there's two schools of thought. Um, what, what, like which one are you? Like you're not well, hyper focused, I mean, but I don't think you're hyper diversified too, right? Well, I'm I I've got like I like to keep it to about twenty. Sometimes it blows up to twenty five. You know, fifteen to twenty is good because then I could do more deeper work on each individual company and follow the news very well. But when you have too many, and sometimes what happens is that, like, I want to sell a company and I say I'm selling. You know, I'm selling, but I haven't sold yet because I think it's still a low sell price. I just don't want to talk about it anymore, and I'll mm -hmm. I'll wait to sell it later. But still, I monitor it in the letter. And so then it gets, a you know, that that's when, you know, the portfolio can get over 20. But right now, like at the end of the year, I, I culled a few of those because now I, I'm really trying to keep it to 20 or below because that's much more manageable and easier to follow. And I could do more detail on, on the news that comes out because especially with expiration, you want to put it into context. Mm. I think this is good what you're saying here, because 
I've talked to you. I had I had this mini show going on. I called it uh, regular portfolios where I would talk to viewers of the channel. You know, I'd say, hey, this is my email. Reach out. Let's have an interview and ask them about what they're investing in. It was kind of an interesting series. I did like, I think, 15 or 20 episodes or something. A lot of them would have a lot of holdings. And you're doing this full time. Like you're going to mine visits. Uh, you you go you're constantly going to conferences around the world. I think um, so, and, and you have fifteen to twenty holdings. So I think that this is a good. I mean, this is this 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 is a good point here that I don't think too many people think about. So, well, you, the thing is that when somebody comes with me and pitches a new idea, then I think, what am I going to sell to buy this? And if it's not better than what I've got already, I'm not interested. Hmm. You know, if it's a if it's a like. So in the portfolio, you know, managing commodities, how much precious, how much gold, how much silver, how much copper, you know, how much whatever else you got, you know, uh, and whether you take on a new commodity or not, then you'll have to come up with a thesis on why you actually want that commodity exposure and then what stage you want it. So once you build up that portfolio, then you think, okay, do I want another gold company? And I say, well, if, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sell one of my copper ones for a gold one. So I'm going to have to take one of the gold ones out. Which one do I take out? I like them all. So mm -hmm. I'm not buying a new one. Uh, so, And I know it. I know the management team of the one I own. You know, I know the news flow. I'm, 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 you know, I'm intimate with the site because I've been there and all that other stuff. You know, it's got to be compelling for me to add it unless... I've got a company that I already own that I want to pitch and I want to, and then I'm waiting to find a new one that I can replace it with. Mm. You know? mm. uh, so there is a bit of that, but if I'm very comfortable in my portfolio or a holding with respect to a stage of, uh, you know, of, of where the asset is, uh, then I, I don't see any reason to replace it with something else and just flitter off and go, oh, this is this is the one this week. I should own this one, you know, because mm -hmm. everyone's talking about it. And I said, well, if I look at it, is it really better than what I've got? No, you know, uh, and also in terms of risk, I know this one much better. You know, I would have to get up on and having the same sort of comfort level that I have with my own stuff, you know. Uh, and to be able to bring that into the portfolio. So that's another thing is that when you look at something and you go, oh, geez, maybe I need more X exposure. And then, hey, wow, in my prospect generator, I do have that exposure and I didn't even realize it. And that was some of the upside that was hidden in that company that gets no value, but suddenly it is because they have a big land package. And then in that land package, their multi-commodity exposure which which I didn't really know about when I bought it. But that's, you know, it's not all downside when you buy one of these. You know, there might be some upside that you didn't even realize existed, you know. Uh, and that's part of the reason to own that prospect generator with a big land package in a good jurisdiction because you never know. Uh, you know, hey, somebody might find something right next door and you've got the property right beside them. Mm. What would you sell if you if you if you wanted to add new stocks? That's a you know that's a very good approach. I've been trying to teach my mom how to do this with her wardrobe because she just <laughs> keeps filling it up, and I'm like, okay, you have to take some stuff out, and then it keeps yeah. spilling out into the living room, and it's like the full the whole apartment's full of yeah. At this point, well, that's the thing is that you know if we go buy the clothing thing, like some people will buy a shirt for an occasion. Just for an occasion, like I've got a brother that does that because he works uh, uh, in a fine clothing store called Harry Rosen in, uh, in in Canada. And so, you know, he's compensated for buying this stuff because he's basically selling what the company does. He's wearing what he's selling, you know. Yeah. For me, it's got to be practical. So when I buy something, I'll spend a lot of money on that item, but I'll have that item for 10 years. Uh. Well, there's mm -hmm. stocks like that in the portfolio that I've held for a while because I've known the CEO for a long time. I understand the model. I know what they're doing. I trust them explicitly, but they might be having a down six months. They might be having a down year, but I know they'll come back, you know, uh, because they're honest, they're hardworking, they manage their share structure, 
you know, they manage their working capital. And, uh, you know, with all those ingredients, I'm willing, I have faith. I'm willing to hold on to it. I'm not going to sell it just like, but on some other companies where I have a really tight thesis, I don't know management that well, but, and, you know, and that might be my fault, but, you know, I'll, I'll buy it. And then I'll say, well, if that doesn't work out, I'm out, you know, uh, because I don't have that long-term sort of trust uh, that I would still hold it. And that's sort of like a good pair of uh, pants, you know, a good toque, what have you, you know, a good, nice pair of gloves, you know, what have you, you know, you just love them and you want to hold them and you just, for any environment, you keep them. Uh, and, and that's the sort of stuff you collect, but you don't need five pairs of those. Mm. Right. Right. And especially now with stocks, you also have the, the macro picture that influences the stocks. Like well, you can have a, a thesis in the commodity, but in, in the end, those are still stocks. So, so the macro influences the, the risk on equities a lot. And, and that's getting increasingly more complicated, at least from what I'm seeing. So that, that, yeah. that, that adds up on top of that. And makes everything more complicated as well. So it's, it's a, it makes sense. Yeah, because there's one thing that's sentiment. Uh, so, you know, expiration, you could be multi commodity focus and commodity agnostic. So, on the expiration side, you're just discovery focused, you know, whatever the commodity. But sometimes there's a problem when they have to, because these are non cash flowing companies, when they have to go back to the market and actually ask for money, the sentiment might not be there. For them to actually receive the money and so then there's more dilution than you would like they might have had to issue a full warrant which you didn't like you know just because the sentiment was bad mm. you know uh but nothing to do with them nothing to do with the asset nothing to do with the jurisdiction nothing to do with the management team it's just that nobody's taking their calls you know mm -hmm. uh you know and and so there is a bit of that in the background that you know that you need that positive sentiment and uh, that sentiment may be turning, but I definitely think it's more for critical minerals, you know, whatever they call it, critical minerals, uh, than for the gold uh, and and the precious right now. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good point. I will. Yeah, I definitely want to touch upon that moving forward. But I, I just before I forget it, because uh, we just sort of mentioned the macro. And um, I know you follow that. You don't follow it as closely as you do follow discoveries, but I, I still know that you keep you know keep, keep track of the macro. What is your what's your general outlook on on the macro in twenty twenty three? What are you paying attention to the most? Well, I mean, one everyone's paying attention to is uh, you know a potential pivot in the interest rates for the Fed, and but then you know what does a pivot mean? Does a pivot mean reducing rates or just? stopping the increase or reducing the rate of increase. The impression I get, and and, and I think what the Federal Reserve has been stating, is that uh, you know uh, the rate hikes will moderate, but there might be more hikes longer than people think that they will be. And uh, you know the terminal rate might be higher than people think. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going with. Uh, so um, the pivot for me, maybe a reduction in the the quantum of the hike yeah and for me looking at gold what i follow uh, uh you know is really uh the trend not the not the uh uh the actual number uh i i follow the trend of uh, real rates so if real rates are negative and they're going positive that's bad for gold if they're positive and going negative that's good for gold because uh, right now we haven't seen a lot of ETF investments, uh, you know, uh, into gold, more withdrawals. What made gold go up, even though real interest rates were declining recently, uh, has been central bank purchases, you know. Uh, but I think in the end, to have a real rally in gold, we're going to need the ETFs to come back. Right now, they're not there. I think December was another outflow month for ETFs. So I'm. It's not like uh, like most of the portfolio legacy wise is still precious metals from from grassroots. But now I don't have any more production because uh, I'm worried about margin uh, compression. And I sold a producer last year because I saw that trend happening. Mm -hmm. After I sold it, they generated negative free cash flow in the next quarter, uh, in the next two quarters. Uh, so 
So that's an issue. And especially since they really, some of these producers want to issue dividends and they're sort of more worried about dividends than they are about growth. Such that, you know, I I worry if they're going to have enough money sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're going to just raise debt to pay dividends in the end. Um, So that's one thing. And that's why I've gone more to royalty, royalty generators and those sort of companies uh, for, for, to eliminate that exposure to margins or just reduce it. Um, grassroots and I still got a lot of precious metals and some development plays uh, as I mentioned off air that have a unique investment thesis uh, I've still got a couple of those and then I, you know, when I've been selling precious I've been buying copper so that's what I've been more injecting into the portfolio after uh, over the last 12 to 18 months mm. Is it, that, that's your, your biggest thesis then that's what you're most bullish on over yeah. the, what, so, what time yeah. period by the way Oh God, long, long, very long. Uh, it, it's just, you know, I, I'm not worried about the volatility near term three months to a year, uh, you know, about the Chinese, China restart and all this other stuff. It's the same, same thesis I would have for oil. I think in their long run, medium term oil will come back. Um, you know, I, I even think coal prices will come back because of the underinvestment. That underinvestment thesis pervades for a lot of commodities. But I do like copper more than some of the metals that go into the battery just because it's the infrastructure. So technically, the car companies can can manufacture a metal outside of the battery if it's a bit too risky. Uh uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, they can't they can't uh, sort of technically take out the infrastructure, the intensity of copper. It, it'll go up, but it's not that big of a deal in terms of the overall cost of the car. You know, but the intensity goes up three times, five times, depending on the type of car between a hybrid and a, and a fully electric vehicle. Um, mm. Yeah, and the, and for me. It's not only about demand. For me, supply is almost or even more important. And the reason supply is more important for me because it's something you can you can put your hands on. It's harder to forecast growth. It's harder to fo- forecast EV penetration. It's harder to forecast you know green technology growth in individual countries or regions and all that. But it's easy to know that this project is not going to happen. You know, it's going to be deferred. Uh, you know, this production's not going to happen. This thing will never get permitted. That's easier to do. And what I see is there's a lot of risks on the supply side. Mm. And and now with the issues in Chile and Peru, uh, a lot of people are deferring capital projects that are not greenfield projects. They're expansions of current projects. Some projects going from... Uh, you know, uh, oxide enriched, which requires solvent extraction to uh, sulfide. And now that needs a mill, that needs a bigger multi-billion dollar investment. But then, you know, it goes, well, okay, uh, let's figure out what Chile's new tax stability agreement is. Let's see if we can get the water. Do we have to build a desalinization plant, you know, or will the community approve this expansion and that? Uh, And so unless they get all that worked out, they're not going to put that money in. Mm. And so some of those pounds are already in the forecast of high probability production coming in in 2024, 2025, which may not even be there. Mm. I'm not saying it's never going to be there, but it might not be there then. And so suddenly we're pushing things out more. And so a lot of the potential deficits uh, you know, gaps in production might come earlier than people suspect because a lot of the stuff they think is going to come in may not come in. And mm-hmm. I'm not just talking about greenfield projects. So a lot of the expansions we see, like like I was in Africa and Zambia and saw Consanche with First Quantum. I mean, because of the change in the in the government there, pro pro business development and things like that. You know, of projects that make sense, and Consanche is you know, before Kamoa Kakula came out was the biggest copper project in, in, in Africa. And that's going to almost double its throughput Mm -hmm. and go deeper. Uh, And then coalesce some of the open pits there, you know? Uh, So for me, that's interesting. 
you know, that that this is where people are investing because, you know, First Quantum's got problems in Panama. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, they're going to go underground at Las Cruces in Spain, you know, uh, so and, and that requires a lot of development. But people don't mind putting that money in. People, some people ask me, well, do you think they'll do it uh, because of the capital escalation and blah, blah, blah? And I said, well, they'll have to do it because if they don't do it, they're not going to hit this 2025 window. You know, uh, you know, in terms of the cyclicality of, of copper, you want pounds into that window. Mm -hmm. So so people will spend it. They might not spend it in gold because they might not be convinced that, you know, the uh, the growth in the gold price will be as as significant as the growth in the copper price. And hence you see, you know, one of Barrick's major investments coming up is in a copper gold project in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so so that's interesting. Mm. Sure is, and um, you, you sort of touch upon why I asked you what your time, your outlook is in terms of time is because pretty much because of what's been happening throughout the last couple of weeks, and you you touched upon all of them, all of these things. Um, you had the protests in Peru. You have the red tape, you know, government issues in Chile. You have First Quantum having issues in Panama. Last week, Panama government came out saying you, you cannot expand any of these mines. Um, then First Quantum also had has troubles in in the U.S. Even where they're struggling to find uh, people to work at their mines. Right there, they have um, one thousand three hundred job openings, is what they reported last week. So that's a huge number of job openings, right? Um, uh, Freeport McMoran, that's it, not Freeport, First Quantum. Yeah, uh, I, I, don't think first quantum I, I saw you looking it. confused. It's true. No, it's Freeport McMoran, not First Quantum. But yeah. for Freeport McMoran has um, issues with with, um, with labor in the U.S., which they're saying it's going to affect their long-term production. And yep. then all of this is sort of happening as China is reopening. And it's also happening while we are at, at you know um, a, a very low inventory of copper you know years how many years i don't know how many years low inventory of copper so how do you think these things combine they, they happen at the same time how does that influence the 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 the, the time outlook on copper because it everybody's been saying it's a long long-term play but does it does that bring it closer to to now or i think it brings think? it closer because because the eia put out that study on critical minerals in in europe and uh, oh well, I mean it's it's more about the macro, but you know their average time to development from discovery to production for copper was fifteen to eighteen years. Mm. So essentially, if we don't know this project now, it's not going to make it into this window. You know, and then the projects we know now, not all of them are going to make it into that window just because of all the issues that you just highlighted, and they may but they might get deferred. They might be smaller than we think. You know, there's there's a risk to almost every pound that's going in there, you know, uh, especially off of the baseline production. If you take the, you know, the baseline production is going to go like this and it's that next layer that we need, you know, and then we need that extra layer if we want to fill the gap. That extra layer is problematic, but now even that new layer that that's the growth and expansion of existing uh, mines is also problematic mm. uh, in Chile and in Peru. Um, and, you know, that that's that's basically why a company like Barrick would go to Pakistan. You know, it was like, uh, you know, where else am I going to go for a copper project that makes sense for me? And and that's why you'll see a lot of people like I'm I'm heading to Africa uh, uh, next week for Indaba. Um, and, you know, like we were talking off air, I think we, we talked about, you know, the U.S. government coming back into Africa because the Chinese have been there for a while, the Russians, uh, and now the critical minerals they need, you know, technically was limited to either domestically sourced or free trade agreement countries. They don't have free trade agreements with a lot of these countries with critical minerals in Africa. So now they're making deals with Zambia and the DRC, uh, you know, for these critical minerals just to feed their supply chain but potentially also to get cathode because most of the uh, copper concentrates are treated in smelters in China. So that doesn't work in terms of getting an EV credit uh, in, in the States, mm. but their smelters in Zambia, First Quantum has one and they're expanding it. 
So what they produce is actually cathode. And so they might want to invest in, in regions where they can put the money down for these expansions of facilities that they can't permit in the States. Like, a, you know, there hasn't been a new copper refinery in the States forever or an oil refinery for that matter. It's impossible. It's, a, it's very hard to permit. But if you have a free trade agreement with a country that has one and now you take Department of Energy money and help it, which they're doing now, they're, they've got investments now in certain companies with rare earth processing facility in Texas, a nickel one in the northern part of the States. So they're putting money into those. Whether those are linked or make the probability of the project actually be better in terms of permitting, I don't know if there's a connection because everything is pending a permit. But but yeah. we're seeing more money like that come up, you yeah. know, uh, for projects yeah. because they understand now the, the issues. But interestingly, the states does not consider copper a critical mineral yet. Yeah. You know, uh, but Europe does, and uh, and so does Canada. Mm. Yeah, it's it seems like um, the U.S. and their efforts to subsidize some parts of the natural resource industry are more of a political game, more of a like look how ESG friendly we are, and here's some money for this lithium project. But let's block this whole portion of the United States for the next twenty years. Um, it's like, okay, like, what, what do you really care about? Is it political cloud or do you really care about the future of these metals, which are funny, funny that you mentioned uh, copper is not considered a critical metal while it very much is. Um, yeah, yeah. I it, mean, the, the problem is that they look at domestically and they think, well, maybe we don't need as much. But the problem is once you have these battery vehicles, once you have these, the, you know, green uh technologies they need a lot of uh, copper for conductivity and infrastructure which they're not looking at the whole picture uh and the problem is that you know in democratic countries which we live in um the picture is only painted for three to five years mm. and after that the politician's not there anymore and, and there's not a lot of politicians that think about building that thing that'll last another 30 to 40 years uh, because they, they they might not get reelected uh, if they increase taxes or do something that basically invokes something that they'll never get credit for. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's not a problem for a command account an economy like China. You know they'll build a 10, 20 year plan and they'll they'll transition their economy, you know, to carbon neutral. But in the meantime, they're still expanding coal production. In the meantime, they've still got you know, uh, uh, natural gas, you know, they're, they're not. Uh, so the problem with the whole idea of, of, of critical minerals and the carbon neutral society by 2035 or 2040 is that in between there's a transition and you're going to make it worse if you underinvest in some of the energy that you need to fund the transition. You underinvest in oil, you underinvest in coal, you invest in all these things that are, you know, bad for the carbon neutral society. But if you don't invest them, you're going to like lead to hyperinflation in the interim because all this other stuff is not going to make it in time. Mm -hmm. You know, still with the EIA by, you know, it's still in 2025, 2030, you know, uh, coal is still a big source of power, you know, uh, even beats all the green energies combined. So we're we're still not there with the transition until potentially 2050. But if you underinvest in coal and natural gas, you know who's going to supply you the power? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're adding more, you know, uh, requirements on the power by building up more EV penetration, and suddenly everybody needs more power for their cars. Mm -hmm. And it's like it only makes sense for coal, right? Because of it, it's it's cheap, it's it's rarely available, readily available, uh, and it's 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 just reliable energy, which is what you need um, to to which is what you want energy to be, right? In the first place, and also what you need to lift uh, people out of poverty in the first place. So there's well, a, there's you see no those pictures coming out of Germany where they're basically eliminating a town and mm. then they're taking back some of the uh the wind farms uh, to to you know basically yeah. do a layback on a big coal mine there 
mm-hmm. you know, but but that's some of their own stupidity for being so uh, like uh, exposed to Russian natural gas. You know, they should have gone and kept nuclear there. Yeah. You know, uh, and and diversified more. Uh, but they went ahead and said, "Oh, you know, natural gas. You know, we, we and we don't have to build it here. We just get the pipeline. Da 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 da. And then, oh my God, we're exposed to Russia, and mm-hmm. now they're going back to the coal mines. And so they're not going to meet their climate targets now that they're you know doing coal again. And and so a lot of this stuff has to be more realistic. You know, uh, if you really have a plan, have a plan that works." Mm-hmm. Right now, I don't see a lot of plans, except potentially for China, that actually make any sense. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like eating uh, ice cream for breakfast. You know, it gives you the kick. It's delicious. Uh, it, it's it's easily available. All that, all these things. But then you know, you get you get the sugar crush before lunch, and you want to go to bed. Um, <laughs> been there. You, I looked through, through your Twitter profile and I saw that some of those so-called critical minerals, uh, critical metals are on your bio. So you you had written uh, lithium and nickel on there, uh, alongside other stuff, but there was no no other battery metals. So uh, but where'd you where'd you stand on those? Like we have um, cobalt, I, I manganese, was... silicon, graphite. Yeah, and so on. no, my 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 thesis is more about the carbon neutral world and how do i get exposed to that because that's being regulated mandated something everybody's talking about so what's my exposure to that commodity wise my biggest exposure to that world is copper okay uh and mostly that uh you know uh i have a little bit of nickel the lithium i had ended up being a surprise within a prospect generator I wasn't looking for it, but then I, then, then I found it. Uh, so um, I, I, cobalt and all that. Um, my, my worry about some of these ones, again, in the battery, is that if, they, if that metal becomes too problematic and too expensive and hard to get, and, 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 and suddenly you know the supply chain doesn't work, then the, there's people smart enough to manufacture a way of not needing that metal. And that's mm-hmm. what you can see in the progress of batteries as they try to eliminate the exposure to cobalt. You know, so if there's any issue with any specific, like micro commodity, uh, special commodity, it's it, that's going to be problematic. I mean, everyone's probably convinced that there's a lot of lithium out there. It's the lithium projects that make sense. And what's made lithium work is that the spodumene concentrate market just went nuts. You know, uh, but really on a mining side, you're not really doing a lot. You're taking something that's one to one and a half percent lithium oxide, concentrating into five and six percent and then sending it off. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really not rocket science, but the cost of that's mm-hmm. skyrocketed because there's just no other lithium because the brines can only produce so much, you know, and, uh, you know, you can almost count how many brines there are and that's it. You know, then after that, it's got to be these uh, uh, these spodumene dikes. You know, mm-hmm. these lithium dikes, and there there there's a lot of them out there, but yeah. they tend to be open pit, high strip, and you and they need to be infrastructurally sound because you're going to be sending this bulk commodity, which is five or six percent lithium uh, oxide product somewhere. So you need rail, you need road, you need port, you need all that sort of stuff. Do you think I have not followed with that market at all? It was out of the blue for me that it exploded. Do you think that because it sort of exploded and then it plateaued, um, it sort of stayed there more or less? Do you expect it to stay there? Do you expect it to come down? Does it go higher? What, what What's your take on lithium? Well, I, I'm not sure about, I mean, I, I know the demand is there uh, for it. Uh, uh, but again, if if people can manufacture a way of you know uh, you know reducing their exposure to it, uh, you know they will. If the if the price gets uh, too high or the supply uh, is problematic, so there's two things that people worry about if they're if they're building these batteries and building these cars is not only the price of those uh, pro- parts and the commodities that go into those parts, but also are they reliable? Can I always get them? And if I can't get them reliably, which is more important, the, and where I'm getting it from, 
because then if I'm getting it from the wrong source, then I then the people buying my car don't get the EV credit, which is what they need to buy it, and might that might rule really low, you know lower my the demand for my car. So there's a lot that's going in that. Uh, for me, you know, I, I think that I've missed the lithium thing, but you know, I, I look at this prospect generator that that's almost doubled because of this their closeology on this other lithium play. I say, well, geez, I, I got exposure to it, but you know, almost serendipity. I, I didn't plan on it. Mm. Uh, it's just because I owned a prospect generator with a big land package that's been in the area for a long time and the same structures and the same geology that hosts some of the metals that they were looking for just happened to also host these dikes. Mm. It, it seems to me like there might be, um, it's almost like there's like two strategies at play here or in the natural resource space. Like you have the supply deficit commodities with sort of undeniable demand, which is copper, electrification of everything. You know, what, what are you going to replace it with? Um, silver, silver is much expense, much more expensive. You cannot, I mean, there's no real substitution there uh, until copper totally goes nuts. But then on the other hand, you have the other strategy, which sort of relies on government subsidies. Uh, a lot of these things like, you know, for the batteries, for example, um, I'm not sure how many people would be buying electric vehicles and electrifying their lives as much if there was not as much um, push from the government. So. Yeah, in terms of credits, yeah. um, you're probably right, you know, uh, but I mean, when we had a, uh, you know, when, when you have like issues with the oil price, and then suddenly, you know, filling up your car is much more expensive. I, I remember that was happening last year, the, mm. you know, these people in where I live who had Teslas and these EVs, and my wife's got a hybrid, we were pretty happy, you know, <laughs> so so you do have that little bit of uh, you know relief every now and then, but you're right. It's you know it, it's still more expensive for the electric vehicle, such that if you want uh, the base consumer to start buying it versus the internal combustion engine, there's got to be that incentive still. Mm. But still, the more penetration that have, the more uh, you know uh, lean you have on on power. Mm. So suddenly. You know, not only when the power goes out, you can't run your house in that, but now you can't even drive your car. Mm. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, you're going to need more power for that. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of logistics around it, you know, and, and the constraint on the parts, the constraints on the supply of the minerals will constrain penetration of electric vehicles. You know, that people are forecasting, you know, such, a, you know, a great penetration of electric vehicles so fast. It might be constrained by the inputs into these vehicles as well, because if the inputs get more expensive, also the price of the vehicles will go up and then constrain the demand of them. Um, you know, unless these people can manufacture a way out of those metals, you know, and, and that might not be possible. So there's a lot of assumptions with the demand for critical minerals. That's why I sort of like copper, because no matter how I change the chemistry and, you know, the input into the battery, I still need that basic infrastructure. What you're saying pretty much is is that Kathy Wood and uh, Ross Gerber should also pay attention to the, min to the minerals, not only to Tesla. Um, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, but these uh, they they sell their their funds based on being super tech, mm. you know. And unless you've got a real technical bent on your lithium play, and you're not just mining one to one and a half percent lithium oxide and making it into five or six percent and then trucking it, that's not very exciting for a tech fund. Yeah, yeah, and at the end they care about AUM and and and, and two and twenty. Uh, I mean, I don't even think they care about bull and bear markets and shortages and stuff like that. So, well, what kind of car does does your wife have? That's just out of interest. <laughs> well, she got one of those uh, uh, those minis, those oh, hybrid. Yeah. yeah, the Countryman. Uh, that's a oh, that's a plug-in hybrid. Yeah, it's a plug-in hybrid, but it's yeah, but what's nice about it is that a lot of you know the driving the kids back and forth and that is within its chargeability like 20 kilometers nice nice yeah, yeah that, that's but, but if you're that, on the that, highway that's... you need fuel you know and i feel better about that because i can never be sure where we can charge it absolutely absolutely um, still that infrastructure i mean from here to whistler and then maybe all the way down the west coast you have that infrastructure but mm -hmm. in other places you don't and you don't want to be constrained in terms of driving that car because you you're, there's a risk 
that you might not find some place to charge it. Yep, absolutely. That's pretty much my personal experience with, with an electric vehicle. And then so getting rid of it and going back into a diesel because of because of that reason. And I live in Belgium. It's a pretty small country. So um, I don't have the luxury of going to the, to the Whistler bike park, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> that might have been fun. We, we just sit on... Um, on energy, then we we sort of th- threw it around a little bit. Oil, coal, uh, natural gas, all these things. I uh, mean, um, uh, to to a lot of people's disappointment, we are not freezing over here in Europe. I mean, as you can see, I'm still yeah. alive. So um, then you have uranium as well, which I know you're bullish on. How do what, what do you send on energy? I'm 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 bullish. Like I mean, if we look at you know like uh, the performance of tech last year, a lot of that outperformance was because of their coal exposure Mm. you know uh that's what really did it for them and if you look at you know the share price of something like peabody that did really well as well um so even though these are old economies like if i look at the at the commodities etfs and everything i sort of monitor on a weekly basis for my subscribers and myself you know uh you know, after the first quarter of last year, the you know the ones that were outperforming was anything linked uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, oil, uh, uh, um, uh, natural gas, nickel, palladium, all that was doing really well. Uh, but at the end of the year, two of the things that did the best uh, was coal uh, and 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 uh, and lithium. Mm. So it's like a combination of the old economy and the new economy, which sort of uh, looks a little bit strange, you know, juxtaposed to each other, but makes absolute sense if you think about transition, because that's what we should be seeing. And especially if we're under investing in one of them versus the other, you know, one, one of them's got this demand pull and there's not enough projects coming through, which would maybe be lithium, but the other one, it, you know, nobody's investing in new projects, hmm. you know, because um, the ESG uh, investment can invest in coal, you know, so where is it going to get funded from, you know, and, 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 you know, if the Department of Energy is funding clean energy, it's not funding coal, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so where is this baseload energy going to come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about lifting people out of poverty. What options do you really have to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, like, what what natural gas reached a fifty two week low recently, and and Today. that's yeah because of you know uh, it's much warmer in Europe than they expected, and that basically saved Europe from going into a recession, or at least Germany. Uh, you know, the, the weather worked out great for them. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I mean, are you going to count on that every year? Uh, you know, uh, and and that's why they're getting the coal plants going back again. But I mean, they got to seriously consider nuclear. Mm. You know, just like Japan has to seriously consider going back into nuclear, you know, mm. uh, and, and reduce their exposure to uh, some other commodities and to some other uh, supply chains. Yeah. Natural gas is at 266 as we speak. Um, this is a very low level. Um, it, if, you, if you account for the last three years, but if you sort of remove that, it's uh, if, if you remove the volatility of the last two to three years, it's not as low of a level i mean in, in 2020 it, it got down to what 150 or something so do you, do you expect any more downside there well i mean i always uh like we used to trade natural gas when i worked for phelps dodge because i used to trade on behalf of the company so half my job was as a market analyst and the, the other half was as a uh you know associate to the head trader and so natural gas was always the highest volatility commodity uh and it was very seasonal so weather was huge in terms of an impact on natural gas you know summer is too hot natural gas goes up for the air conditioning winter is too cold natural gas goes up for the furnaces um so it was it was all trying to predict the weather and weather predictions have been better of late Mm. Uh, but they still didn't pick what was going to happen in in europe in terms of being warmer than they thought uh you know and 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 the other positive i mean the other burden that they had was that europe was building up inventories in anticipation of the winter so there's still these inventories that they have to get through but now they don't need them you know because uh nobody's using the heat as much because it's not so cold uh Mm. 
So they prepared for a winter where they would exasperate the inventories in a matter of weeks. But now those inventories are basically um, um, depressing the price. Mm -hmm. You, 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 something that does not depend on the weather is, is supply deficit. And you mentioned that you like that in copper. Um, do you think that uranium proposition is is better though? Because it, it seems like the supply deficit is very clear there, or am I missing something? Well, the supply issue in uh, you know the market balance, let's say in in uranium, is harder uh, to to see, uh, more opaque than the copper market. The, the copper market used to be very visible when I worked on it in the 2000s because the amount of, let's see, opaque inventories was limited and everybody would, you could see basically the LME, you could see the Shanghai when it was when it started and you could obviously see the COMEX. And then when some companies held inventories, they would tell you like Cadelco, when they were producing and not selling, they would tell you how much copper they were holding. So we could model all of that. And then that might have been, I don't know, 80 to 90 percent of global inventories. And so it was an excellent proxy for where the world was with inventories. But as China became where most of the smelting capacity is, and 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 then also the number one consumer of copper, where those inventories were held, who held how much was harder to pick. The visible exchanges would still tell you that there was a deficit. Or, or you were at very low weeks of inventory, but you weren't sure if there was other inventories out there. In mm. uranium, it's worse. You can't see anything. And, you know, regulatory frameworks might make people not, not want to tell you either. Yep. But now copper has become more opaque in terms mm. of knowing how the weeks of inventory and the global inventories that are visible on the exchanges actually relates to what you know how much copper there is so th what you need to watch is the premium on copper cathode in china so if you watch that you know that hey there's even more demand for copper than's actually there hmm. and so they'll pay a premium on top of the lme price to get copper or if they're paying a discount to the lme price they're telling you that there's more copper out there than uh than than you think you know, uh, so that's what I would watch uh, as, as well to support your thesis. You know how uh, how the inventories and where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in with respect to uranium, it's harder. Uh, so what to watch there is the long term contracts. So as we see more long term contracts being signed, that's the market. That's the buyers telling me that they don't have enough. They're now willing to take long-term contracts and fix their prices because they're not sure where they're going to get those pounds of, of uranium in the future because those inventories are coming down to critical levels. Yep. So when I see more of those, which I'm seeing, uh, then I get more positive. Mm. That's exactly what I was, I was going to bring up is that last year we saw many more long-term contracts being signed uh, at higher prices too, higher prices even than what the average spot was. So that was also sort of giving me a signal that if the fuel buyers are being conservative, they're trying to secure supply at higher prices than what they could get on the spot market. Maybe they're sort of getting worried about okay, what 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 is the what, what do we have out there in terms of um, above ground inventory? Yeah, so, and we got to realize that uranium, uh, you know, feeds the nuclear power industry. Uh, that's a good base load of energy so uh that's the other good thing about uh that uh and and you know and then you add the layer of supply chain you know that is is kazakhstan a good supply source do you have to diversify outside of kazakhstan you know i don't i don't know but if that ever becomes questionable then you know all bets are off in terms of you know because a lot of guys get you know, inexpensive pounds of uranium from Kazakhstan uh, because they have more ISR, you know, and, and it's cheaper to produce there, less environmentally regulated. Uh, so they can get away with things that you probably couldn't do in other places. Yeah. And but we saw that getting up an issue, too, because Adam Prom issued last week saying that uh, they're expecting five million pounds less production in 2023. That's a big thing. It's about four percent of the annual supply of uh 
uranium because they're having issues uh sourcing their acid that they use for um well for yeah. isr and yeah. the acid's pipe. huge acid's yeah. huge yeah acid's huge like like when i was in zambia like even you know through western us as well for these uh solvent extraction electro winning projects for copper you know uh you know the 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 cost of acid sulfuric acid sulfuric acid has gone up quite a bit um but what's weird in zambia is that they, because they have a smelter there first quantum but infrastructurally it's hard to sell that acid into the world market so they can drop the grade of their copper oxides to very low because they're just going to put their acid on it anyway you know, so uh, it'll absorb it. It'll, you know, get it out of the system. And, uh, you know, whereas if you got that stuff to market, you could make a lot of money off it, but it's harder to get it to market. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uranium is more complicated than copper. That makes sense. It's an obscure market too. Um, yeah, and it's regulated, right? And that's that's the other issue. Uh, you know, well, how uh, do you mean? Well, it, 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 you know, nuclear weapons and, you know, the, what, what you get out of the uranium and where that's going, it's, it's much more highly regulated by the governments, you know, um, like in, 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 uh, when I was in Australia, you know, uranium was a big deal and, uh, they only had a three mine policy in terms of how many uranium mines that they could actually be. So what the company used to do is they named all the mines the same name. So. So to get to get around that so ranger one ranger two ranger three okay. so yeah so uh yeah so uh, and, and then also uh now uh you know in terms of chinese exposure and m a and you know uh, uh you know uh, in canada as well like you know they don't want chinese companies to own canadian resource companies or assets that are critical and if uranium is one then you'll see less of that you know for a saskatchewan asset that you know has a chinese uh, joint venture partner that might not be possible anymore mm -hmm. so so what kind of companies do, do you pay attention to in the uranium space like is it because it, apparently and you tell me if that's true or not but i've just heard rumor that it's, the uranium geology is even more complicated than like gold geology for example so do, do you still like do you pay attention to exploration companies or? Uh, I, I did. I mean, um, I, I don't know about that statement uh, in terms of uh, uranium versus gold, mm -hmm. uh, because if I'm looking for a commodity that I measure in percent versus a commodity that I measure in parts per million, mm -hmm. the one in parts per million is going to be harder to find, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so uh, I don't think uranium is harder to find, but it's harder to extract, uh, you know, depending on the system that you pick to extract it. And then you have a lot more regulations controlling how you can extract it, you know. Um, so uh, it, it's more problematic in terms of uh, you're being monitored very highly uh, because it's uranium. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, in, in terms of... Um, exploration uh, or exposure to uranium uh, i've i picked a company that's got assets that can be flipped on in an environment of rising prices uh it's got a plant uh and that's hard to get in the u.s a plant that actually can process uranium because again highly regulated um and they're also looking into rare earths which is another exposure mm -hmm. that i like but i'm not going to go out specifically to look for a rare earth company but if i can get it in the in the company i've already got i'm more than happy with it mm -hmm. and and the way they treat it they can treat you know, some sands, uh, uh, heavy mineral sands that have rare earths in them, but they also have a lot of deleterious metals, uh, elements, including uranium, that other plants can't treat, but they have a permit to do it. Uh, mm. So it makes it easier for them. And, and so for me, what you will see, because it's so much harder to permit mines and that, people trying to get every mineral that they can out of the stuff that they extract. So if it's got a bit of tin, I'm going to put a new circuit in there to get that tin out. If it's got a bit of cobalt that you know that you would have just left on the stockpile before, you're going to work on a metallurgical process to get that cobalt out because it's already sitting up above ground and you've already got everything out permitted. So 
you'll see a lot more of that because to try and get something permitted takes so much longer in some countries that you will try and you'll see people try to squeeze as much as they can out of the fact that they already have a plant there and it's already permitted mm. and feed and then avoid reclamation obviously but also try to lever off of that yeah especially if it's the only uh mill in the united states that's permanent then um that becomes an interesting proposition which in in your example if i i think i know who you're talking about i think it gets an interesting proposition there and in, indeed something you mentioned here makes me think about something that i've also been thinking about though is um looking at the at, at, at commodity cycles in general there's a there's this commodity cycle clock from the deutsche gold measure um that I've been looking at over the last few weeks. And it seemed like we might be around the time where m a is sort of starting to um, slowly pick up. Um, but it's not like it's, it's not as, 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 um, as reckless, I guess, as it was last time, right. At, at the end of the last cycle where I've also been reading about this in a, in, in a book, um, how reckless it got and people got disappointed from it. And um, I mean, I was still in diapers back then, so I don't really remember anything of it. But th this time around, it, it looks like what you just mentioned, that, that we might have like technological developments and that miners might be spending more time and money understanding their ore body that they are already mining instead of immediately jumping to buy, you know, a smaller explorer or or, 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 or an explorer that looks that, that ha has a, a big ore body or something. So... How do you look at the current M&A activities? Like, do you expect to see lower premiums for explorers during this cycle because of this phenomenon and because of what happened at the end of the last cycle? Or do you just expect history to repeat itself? Okay, but which commodity are we talking about? Because every, every each one is different in terms of where it is in its own little cycle. Okay, uh, that's interesting. No, I was not aware of that. I was just sort of taking the commodity super cycle as a whole. Um, yeah, so if we look like, let's say, copper, we've had some major acquisitions like Rio Tinto buying yep. uh, Turquoise uh, uh, Hill for the you know, another portion of Oyu Tolgoy, which they already operate and are trying to make it into an underground uh, mine. Uh, then you also had uh, BHP closing the acquisition of Oz Minerals. Um, you had, you know, you have Barrick pushing very hard to. Uh, they they bought the other part of uh, Rico Dig to uh, gain exposure to that and put that into development. Um, so that's happening uh, already, and it's already happened. On the m a space in Precious, we've seen uh, an attempted uh, mega merger between Goldfields and Yamana that didn't go through, and eventually Agnico and Panama, you know, split the company, uh, you know, but it didn't spur a lot of other m a you know and we've seen some intermediates or smaller single asset companies juniors buy another one to just get more diversification not only with jurisdiction but also in terms of assets so we see a lot of that that's mostly shares there's not a lot of cash being offered uh in in those transactions um i would say now there's probably more m a potential for uh for copper uh than then for precious right now um you know so you would really have to love that precious metal exposure that you have uh and and uh in order to hold it um i think there's more potential for uh for m a uh in, in, in the copper space right now mm -hmm. So what about then the rest like uranium specifically because what i've been thinking why i'm asking this let me maybe tell you that because it, it might make more sense is that um there's sort of this this way of thinking it seems out there that if you just buy a junior that's uh attractive enough for a major you're going to get a big premium on it once there is sort of a craze in the market you know a, a very big bull market or whatever it is and I, I don't know if that's going to be the case this time. Like, it seems like this time companies buying smaller pro smaller companies might be more picky. Like, does, does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, they're being held to the fire by their investors. Uh, but, but the investors want growth. And so some of the, sometimes the growth is by acquisition, but that's, that's, that's uh, that's sort of like a circular argument because once you buy that asset, suddenly you need more 
to show growth because now you've got a bigger reserve base, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, the other issue is that, you know, in the precious metal sector, back in the day, uh, when you were in diapers, maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, um, what people paid for a precious metal asset was a multiple of what it was actually worth mm -hmm. because of the leverage to the underlying commodity, which was gold. So, so I remember when I was with, uh, with Phelps Dodge, I'd say, well, what do we pay for an asset? We pay 50% of NPV. Why? Copper is cyclical. Uh, you know, the capital numbers can be wrong. The operating numbers could be wrong. The resource could be wrong. So whatever they say, take a cut. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I got to Newmont, you know, the average company was trading at two times their valuation, their mm -hmm. net asset value. Mm -hmm. And so you had to pay a premium on top of a premium to acquire an asset. Mm -hmm. And if that asset didn't work out, the write-off was even more significant. Because if you get to the baseline value, what the account would call it, it would be nowhere near what you paid for it. Mm. And so if you took a write down, it would be significant. And a lot of people did take write downs. Yeah. Uh, but in, 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 in marginal cost industries like copper, it's harder to justify those premiums, you know, uh, because that's just not the way uh, it works with them. Mm -hmm. Nobody pays a 20% premium on top of NPV. You know, mm -hmm. nobody says, oh, you know, the copper price is whatever, but I'm going to put in five bucks to buy your asset. No, they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it, it's a different mindset. Definitely. It's a different mindset in terms of how those acquisitions happen. That mindset is not happening right now, but still there's companies out there that are trading at a premium to their net asset value in precious metals. That doesn't happen as often or not at all in, in, in the copper space. What about uranium then? I mean, uh, the, there's plenty of companies that trade already at like 1.2 times um, NPV, especially the ones that have had um, DFSs, PFS, whatever. And and when you bring that question up to somebody and you say like, okay, you know, when I, I'm interviewing an executive and I, I'd be like, do you think your company's fairly valued because you're trading at 1.2 times NPV? And they're like, yeah, but if you put in $80 uranium, and I'm like, like, okay, like who does that? Like who takes, you know, you go 50% above spot. But apparently that's a normal thing in uranium or isn't it? Was it was a normal thing. It was a normal thing definitely in the gold space. I, I didn't realize it was normal in uranium because right now any development play gets a big discount because of the capital. Mm -hmm. Because nobody trusts the capital number. Uh, you know, and, and then they say, where are you going to get the money from? Uh, now that you take the Chinese as a partner out and then you take Cameco and say, what was Cameco's last big investment? They raised a lot of money on debt to go buy a downstream stuff in Europe. Because what they see is that uh, really downstream is where the upside is because all this uh, uh, Russian-based uh, control over the nuclear industry in, in, uh, in Europe is going to go away because it has to go away because they can't have any Russian link companies there. So I can fill that void. So I'll buy this um, GE sort of thing that GE wants to sell because it's uh, you know not important to them. But then I've got a more of a soup to nuts uh, uranium company. Mm -hmm. And so my interest there was not in growing by paying a premium on top of a premium for a development project that I don't believe the capital number. So I'm going to pay 150% of what they think they're worth and pay a premium on top of that, knowing that that capital number is probably 50% of what it's going to be. Oh, and wow. I operate these assets knowing that that operating cost is like 50% of what it actually is. Mm -hmm. So if I plug my numbers in, you're trading like three or four times what I think you're worth. And then I got to pay a premium on top of that. No, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Unless you're Rio Tinto and you're buying a uh, Rough Rider. They yeah, bought. and then they wrote that off and they sold it for nothing, right? Yeah, that was an interesting because some people are even making the um, the argument that um, UEC that bought Rough Rider right now that they maybe even overpaid for it now 
let alone Rio Tinto that paid six hundred and fifty million for it or something. Yeah, so I think they they sold it for about I don't know a quarter maybe of what they bought it for. Mm, yeah, and you're saying that still that's a premium to market. You know who knows, uh, mm. but, but all I'm saying is that if if I have to look, so what I tend to do is look what the industry is doing for an idea of what's happening. What do they see? And usually a, a, what a producer does, if they're sane, uh, they're reacting to the market in terms of what where they think the value is. And Cameco, who's in the Athabasca Basin, who have infrastructure, decides to go do this big thing in Europe because they see the upside being in scaling vertically, mm. being more vertically integrated than having more mines. Yeah. By being able to take their product and control that product all the way down. So they don't have a situation maybe where they're selling to some country and then some country says, you know what, we're not buying your uranium anymore, like in Japan after they had an accident. Yeah. You know, now they, they control the supply chain to say, I know where that pound of uranium is going, and I'm going to make sure that that nuclear reactor that's getting it is working so they can buy my pounds, yeah. you know. So that's more of a tight supply chain. And also they see the growth in trying to service this reactor. So basically maintaining that demand for their own stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think that vertical integration is what a lot of mining companies are looking at, uh, you know, to, in the nickel space and, and, and potentially in the copper space to say, okay, I'm going to avoid the smelters. How? I create this technology like Rio Tinto is doing with Newton and say, I don't need the smelters anymore. I could like basically leach this sulfide copper, you know, if it's a certain type of copper mineralization with a lot of uh, pyrite and that, that generates enough heat uh, that I can uh, keep the, uh, keep it leaching uh, and generate decent recoveries. And then I'm not, I'm not shipping it, no freight costs, no TCRCs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and then I have to negotiate every year. I, I give you cathode. And for the U.S., that's a big deal because even if I have a copper project in the States and it produces concentrate, there's a 50% chance that's going to be uh, processed in China. Right, right. And I, I guess that's what also what I was asking about is because what Cameco did with the acquisition of Westinghouse is um, – it came as a surprise to a lot of people because they 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 opened that um, financing facility and a lot of people out there were like, oh, they're just going to buy next gen. And when yeah. you ask somebody like, hey, why does next gen deserve a premium given, you know, infrastructure and whatever issues it might have, they would say like, well, you know, it makes sense for Cameco to buy them. When you ask them about a small, you know, explorer or whatever that has a deposit that's like, a kilometer deep and you ask them what's going to do, you know, what is this explorer going to do with this project? And they're going to be like, oh, Cameco is going to buy them. And like, that's pretty much the answer. So you, you got a piece of land in the Athabasca Basin. Oh, Cameco is going to buy you. And now Cameco is yeah. coming out and saying, no, I'm not going to buy you. I'm going to buy someone, you know, vertically yeah. integrating me into the different business. But then Did also you now you've taken the Chinese out yeah. as a potential acquirer. So mm. you take the biggest producer out there, you take them out, you know, with respect to being a, a potential acquirer. And now you take... You take the Chinese out, then you say, well, you're going to build that yourself? Mm. Mm. Oh, do you have the capacity to actually mine that yourself? Do you, you know, can can you do those tailings? Can you, you know, can you handle the water? You know, can you can you do all that? You know, that's mm. going to be the question because Cameco is obviously not convinced of the feasibility study uh, of, of those numbers that mm. they, they, they think they're overvalued. For that right. so if they're willing to acquire it they're not acquiring it for the asset for the for the valuation they currently got they want to pay a discount to that they don't want to pay a premium on top of a premium huh. and, and i think that's what they said with that that either it's going to be you know horizontal in terms of growth or you're going to do more vertical integration and they decided on the integration uh, so how do i how do i implement this into myself like how do i not lose money <laughs> on my picks knowing that what, what do i focus on like what, what what projects are going to get acquired and what projects are not going to get acquired well if you don't worry about acquisition you can still do an exploration play because if they do hit something very nice oh, yeah. retail will buy it anyway uh but it'll have 
you know, a wick where once they start getting into technical studies, sell. You know, uh, uh, just take the expiration hit and that's fine. Right now, development's got more of a problem in all commodities because of capital escalation. You know, like you were talking about labor availability, uh, you know, the supply chain stuff is going away a bit in terms of getting stuff. But, you know, the people to produce the parts that you want aren't there. Uh, you know, uh, even, you know, problematically in China, when when they had the uh, uh, COVID restrictions, they weren't producing much. Uh, but now it's freeing up and now the, the ships are moving, you know, uh, manufacturers coming back. And as long as they don't have any hiccups, that should be good. But, uh, you know, like you said, labor availability is a big issue. So if you're building a project, you need peak construction, you need all these people and you need people that know what they're doing. They're not easy to find. Mm. Which is, I guess, we've come full circle to your um, first point that you made about the royalty generators uh, and the royalty companies, because they don't have those issues. Yeah, I mean, they have issues in the sense that, you know, if they buy a marginal project and they do a stream on their main product, that's a problematic asset. You got a stream on 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 their production from a problematic asset. So if they can't produce, you don't make any money, mm. you know, and if they're negatively cash flowing, they're going to shut the thing down and suddenly your stream goes to a trickle. You got nothing. So what I like is royalties is it's not that big of a burden uh, on, on the project. And so the project can keep producing, you know, you're, you know, you're not sort of saying that, Oh, you know, my stream on that's like, 50% of the value of the company, you know, it's going to go really great, you know, and, and um, that's where all the money is great. But if they're not making any money, they're going to stop producing and your stream goes away. Yeah. You know, so that's the risk. And and, and if, when you have a stream on a main product, that's, that's telling me that's a risky project because the bank doesn't want to lend them debt, mm. you know, but but if the core argument with a stream is to get a stream on the byproducts, on the commodities that the investors don't care about. So the ultimate when streaming started was to get the PGMs out of the nickel mines because they didn't care about the PGMs. But, hey, I'll, I'll give you money. You can invest in a processing facility that creates the PGMs, and uh, I get a bit of that. You know, now I get the steady stream of PGMs. You know, and, and that's what you want. That's a classic stream. Lowers their cost of capital, you know, uh, doesn't reduce investors' exposure to the main commodity that they're buying you for and gives you a source of capital, hmm. you know. Uh, and, and so if it, like at, at Phelps Dodge, you know, I used to buy puts for the gold at the copper gold uh, deposit, which was Candelaria, because we didn't care about gold, you know, and nobody bought us for gold. So gold was more like a byproduct that, we, you know, we would use as a cost, reducing our costs. And so it was like we were locking in a credit against our costs, you know. So that works fine because nobody cares in terms of our overall portfolio uh, what how much gold we make, you know. Mm. Um, and that might be a situation for a barrack when they produce copper depending how much uh, uh, copper they produce. If they lock in a really nice margin for their copper in Rico Dick, you know, just because of the political risk and, you know, whatever, um, you know, uh, uh, the company, the, the people that buy them for gold won't care. Mm -hmm. Globally, in terms of production, it might not matter as much, you know, they might keep it below 30% or whatever the magic number is, you know, so, so that's where streams, are a win-win situation. When streams become a burden to the underlying company, then they become very risky, not only for the company, but also for the person that's holding the stream. Hmm. You're giving me an idea for uh, a, a business idea for a um, molybdenum royalty generator because you can go to all the copper producers and, and help them finance. And, and uh, they don't care about the molybdenum, but molybdenum is being spiking in price. So... Huh. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that uh, and, and, at Phelps Dodge, when I worked there, we were one of the bigger molybdenum molly producers in the world. Uh, we never hedged that. Mm. Um, and and uranium, um, that was very volatile. Like at one point, it was $2.50 a pound, and it went up to $50 a pound. Yeah. What people don't understand 
is when you get into a copper moly porphyry, you can pick spots within that porphyry that are moly rich. So even though copper had doubled, you know, from, or maybe even tripled, you know, from 55 cents to a buck 50 to two bucks, moly went from $2.50 to 30 to 50 bucks. So you can pick parts, change your mind sequences. So suddenly you're producing more moly than the market expected because they were thinking you were going to produce the same molly you produced last year. Well, that's the molly I produced when it was $2.50. This is the molly I produced when it's 50 bucks. Nobody has that kind of insight into a mine plan than industry. And so we can produce more molly when we want to. And, and so I never believed in a pure molly play ever because they're, because people like Freeport, then Phelps Dodge can manipulate their mind sequencing such that we could produce more molly if we had to, you know. Uh, so th that's something you got to know when you're looking at, uh, at, at at these commodities that are on the periphery and byproducts is, is that uh, in, in big projects, they can produce it without even thinking about it. You know, a lot of these big mines that produce silver are base metal mines. They don't even care about the silver. You know, uh, the amount of silver they produce is basically a, uh, a function of, let's say, the zinc price or the lead price. Yeah. You know, uh, if the lead and zinc price is low, they're going to produce less silver uh, mm -hmm. because it just comes on as a byproduct. So if you're looking for your byproduct thing, that would be another one. Go to a big base metal mine like a lead zinc mine, get the silver off of them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that would be easy and those guys don't make uh you know people aren't looking for them for silver mm. you know uh, and, and they get uh, a nice kick from that uh, so yeah there, there's a lot of ways to look at it uh in terms of streaming and royalty companies so i prefer the royalty companies because the burden hopefully on the underlying company isn't such that they could actually go under mm. and so having a lot of royalties over a diversified portfolio where people value that cash flow almost at a premium. Like if gold companies are valued at a 5% discount rate, which is ridiculous because their cost of capital can be eight to 10. The royalty guys are getting a cost of capital of 2% or even less, mm. you know, because if they have a big enough portfolio of royalties, nobody's looking at, oh, that one's from this part of Africa or this one's from here. Nobody cares. But, Franco did take a hit in their share price when Cobra Panama went down because that particular stream was a significant part of, of their value. Uh, you know, uh, so when you do have those and they do go under, they can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a significant hit on your valuation. But thankfully, they've got a big enough portfolio that it, that it's not an impact. But if you take a smaller portfolio and then one asset makes all the money and there's a risk to that one, then that's that's that can be problematic, especially if people are discounting it at a very low rate. Mm -hmm. When are you going to write a book, Joe? You have a you, I, like your knowledge is not in a, like it's not. You, we started we started talking about two hours ago, and you told me, "Oh, I've got plenty of time. We got two hours. We're not going to talk for that long." And I'm like, "Ah, eh, we'll see. We'll probably talk for that long." <laughs> So, but you have to, like, you can write a 500 page book, like on, on a weekend. So when are you going to do that? On a weekend? No, I can't wait. I got four kids. And I got oh, okay. a dog. I, no books. Uh, yeah, no books. I, I barely have time to read them, let alone write them. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, and, and it's weird and it's strange, but you know, when I look at the letter, I don't want to plug the letter here, but there's, there's. There's so much information, like even for me, when I look at something, I can look back at the letter because well, I remember this and, and I remember this particular deposit style. When did I talk about that? And I say, well, oh, geez, I featured that when I looked at this one intersection and take that and bring it forward and go, yeah, we looked at this before. This is what I thought about it. And this looks very much like this. And that helps when you go on these site visits, you document them, you see the stuff and you document it in detail and such that you can go back there and get that data and then apply it to what you're doing now. Um, and so that could come from your head or that can come from a big database of knowledge that's that's actually in, you know, in, in the cloud or uh, in a computer form. Yeah. And that's why I love my job. 
you know, because I'm, I'm building up on knowledge. And like you say, you know, do you make mistakes? I make more mistakes than I would like to acknowledge, even with all that data and information. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can reduce the probability of those mistakes mm -hmm. by applying, you know, past experience, by applying knowledge of this deposit style, jurisdiction, site visits, knowledge of management, a network of people that I trust. When I ask somebody about a particular person, they'll say yay, nay. And, you know, then I won't expose that person to uh, my subscribers or to the portfolio. I appreciate your time. And, and please do plug the letter. That's explorationinsights.com. What, 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 what's on there? Tell me more about that. Please do plug it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's a weekly letter. It was initiated and co-founded by Brent Cook back in 2008. I took it over in the latter part of 15. So in another year, I would have been writing it as long as Brent. But, I mean, then I talked to you about that that knowledge base. So our history of going on site visits and seeing things and talking about companies goes all the way back to 2008, you know, uh, and then beyond that, we have our own knowledge, but that's in all these different companies I used to work at and harder to, uh, to compile. But also I have six years as a research analyst and all my notes from there mm -hmm. uh, that I published. Uh, so, so there's a lot of data there. Uh, and then I write on a weekly basis what I'm buying, selling, and everything that I basically talk to you about now in more detail um, in the letter. Mm. Fair enough. Again, explorationinsights.com. Um, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your time. No, Antonio, thank you very much. I really appreciate these uh, long-form talks. It, it, it extracts more information than the 15-minute interview. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate uh, the good work you're doing.